Isaac is about to be a daddy. His wife is pregnant and there are twins in her womb. One older, one younger. According to this lesson that God chooses the younger twin, we're going to find out who he is and what was his traits. There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comment section. Click your link, get your notes, your Sunday school books for the standard international Sunday school is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday school lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. Greetings, welcome, and greetings. Welcome to our first edition of the Sunday School as taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. This is actually the Standard Publishers, also known as the International Sunday School Lesson. I said that I was not going to start teaching it until October. However, this is a lesson that we've gone over in August of 2019. And since I still had the notes and I edited some, I decided to go ahead and teach this lesson, but I won't be back until the first week of October. What a blessing, what a joy and a privilege it is for us to be here today. Listen, if you have not subscribed to this channel, make sure you take a moment, hit that like uh, button, that thumbs up button. Hit the uh, subscribe button and click the bell notification so YouTube will notify you. Bing! Brother Jones uploaded a lesson, although it was not even time for him to do it. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries, Church of God in Christ. We're located 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago. Our zip code is 60620. And lastly, make sure you upload your notes. And if this is your first time, please leave me a comment in the comment section below. I'd like to welcome you to this Sunday School channel. Don't worry about the noise. I'm at the church office. Listen, today we're dealing with God chooses the younger twin. Now, I have a slight disagreement here with this subject matter, but I won't deal with that because the lesson closes. We don't see anything that's taken place that will show why God chose him and uh, anything else, it was, that's just the subject matter. Oh, well, um, we're in the 25th book of Genesis, verses 19 through 34. Our date for discussion is September the 11th, 2022. Happy birthday to those of you all that are celebrating your birthday. If this is your anniversary, happy birthday. And we still mourn the loss of those who lost their lives in the uh, uh, September 11, many years ago. Once again, this is the standard lesson. The next time you see me will be the first week, the Lord say the same, of October. This is the standard publishers, which is known as uh, David C. Cook, Boyd, and it's also known as the international lesson. Let's get right to the reading. If I can figure all this out, I made some changes there it is right there. Now, I know that the lesson starts right here called B, the B section. But I wanted to continue uh, just right where we are. The Bible says, and these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. So right off the bat, you know that we're dealing with Isaac or we're dealing with Abraham's other son uh, by the name of Isaac. So the writer lists the generations of Ishmael. He finds, you'll find that in Genesis the 25th chapter, verses 12. He shifts from that generation to the generation of uh, Isaac at this, or yes, uh, Yes, Isaac. Woo, getting kind of confused. So God called Abraham or Abram away 
uh, the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, which actually took place in the 11th chapter because the 12th chapter says that God had said unto him, had his past tense. The conversation probably took place in the 11th chapter because in the 11th chapter, and this is the extra bonus, in the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis, we find or we see uh, he and his father, Abraham and his father, and all of them are already on their way to Canaan. So therefore, the 12th chapter is a reiteration of what, what God had already spoke. Uh, uh, he called him away from his family, from his country, the 12th chapter, verses 1. He called him into the land that he would show him. And then he promised him that he would be father of many nations. That's Genesis 17, 5 through 6. And it's interesting because at that present time, according to Genesis 11 and 30, uh, there was one major issue to this whole promise of God. And the issue was Sarah was barren. She was not able to produce children. However, God kept his word because 25 years later is when Isaac would be born which was very interesting because God is a God that keeps his word. Let me show you something else. He is a God that shows up and he is a God that keeps his word at all times. We have some technical difficulties, but we're fine now. So, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. Now, Rebekah is the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram the sister to Laban, who is also called the Syrian. Let's look at this. Now, Isaac is the promised blessing of Abraham through Sarah. You'll find that in Genesis, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 3. God promised to multiply the seed of Abraham. Remember, in Genesis 26 and 4, God made a covenant and the promise to Abraham that he was going to multiply his seed. And it's interesting, right before God did that, he changed his name from Abram to Abraham and said, because I have made you a father of many nations. And we're going to find that word nation that's going to show back up in this lesson on today. He also says, point number three, that all families of the earth would be blessed through his seed, through his seed. That's Genesis 12 and 3. So now, Isaac must continue the plan of God that he mentioned to Abram or to Abraham. And the only way for Isaac to continue this plan of God or this plan of action is Isaac has got to have some children. That was interesting because uh, Isaac's wife's womb was barren. She could not bear children as well. We're going to talk about the three generations that married women who were barren. We're going to bring that up. So because the Bible says that in Isaac shall his seed, which is Jesus, be called. Romans 9 and 7. I need somebody to know if God made a prophecy through you and to you, according to you, about you, regardless of what, you may be barren in your life, barren in your situation, but God cannot lie. If he made a promise concerning you, God is going to fulfill this promise and God is going to cause it to come to pass. So Isaac must have a wife for this plan to take place. And then his wife must bear him a child for this plan to take place. Because the Bible says in or through Isaac is where the seed is going to be called out or from. Esau was also 40 years old. So Isaac was 40 years old when he married, and so was Esau. Esau got married at 40 years old, Genesis 26 and 34. And a blessed thing about Isaac, he lived to be 180 years before he died. So we thought that getting married at 40 was too young or too old. But this man lived 180 years total. Uh, then uh, Abraham... Uh, told his servant, this is how his wife came about, because there's a misunderstanding or misquote that says, if a man finds a wife or a man, the Bible doesn't say, not the King James. King James says, whoso findeth a wife, because sometimes the man didn't find his wife. Samson told his parents to go get a wife for him. Ishmael's mother found him a wife. Abraham's servant found his son a wife. And uh, Esau went and got his own wife. 
and that was their custom. It was not customary for a man to find his own wife. It was custom for her to be found or by the parents, and we get that scripture mixed up. So my loving sister said, well, I'm not going to go and look for me a husband because the Bible said he that finds, I got to be found. Uh, uh, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to keep on moving. Abraham told his servant in Genesis 24, 3 and 4, number one, don't take Isaac with you. Number two, do not find a wife for my son among them Canaanite women. And number three, he says, go to my family and find a wife for Isaac. Uh, Abraham's servant went to Abraham's family to find him a wife for Isaac. He was obedient. Laban is the brother of Rebekah. Now, he will show back up later in Genesis 29. Laban would be the one who would deceive Jacob. So we're going to find out that Laban, Jacob, and his mother, Rebekah, were all operating in that field of deception or trickster. Bethuel was the son of Nahor, who was Abraham's brother. So they married into the family due to the strange customs and practices of other nations. And therefore, he says, go and get a wife for my son among my own family. And God selected this wife for Isaac. That's Genesis 24 and 14. Let me put that question on the floor I always ask. When God makes a covenant with man concerning his seed, does that include the woman? In other words, uh, the children that I born, I prophesied and I gave four of my, four of my sons their names before my wife conceived. There was no sh doubt, doubt or nothing. I knew that those four sons were going to be who they were, and I knew that they were going to be boys before my wife was pregnant. My question to you all is, did uh, uh, Abraham have to have Sarah? Did Isaac have to have Rebecca? Or could it be that the man who the promise was made through could have had any woman? What do y'all think? Is the wife part of the covenant is my question. Uh, when God makes a promise to man, is there a specific woman that this promise was fulfilled in or through? I welcome your comments below. I welcome everybody. Talk to me. I'm ready. Y'all can go deep if you want to. I'm going to go deep with you. I'm going to go down there in China and we're going to order us some number two chicken wings. So the Lord was with the birth of Isaac and selecting the wife for Isaac because God's plan will always take place. Yes, it will. His plan will always take place. Let's look at verses number 21. Lay down there. And Isaac entreated. Now, let me see if I can go back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, when he took the wife, the daughter of Bethel. Yeah. Boom, boom. Okay, good. Now, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. Here's why he entreated the Lord for his wife. Because she was barren. And the Lord, now notice the spelling, it's all caps, all caps. When you see that word Lord is all caps, that is a specific one, which sometimes means the self-existent one. Uh-oh, uh, that's an E or A, I can't remember which one. <laughs> it means that God is the self-existent. So this verse shows us that spouses can intercede for one another. Yes, you can intercede for your spouse. Spouses can intercede for one another. I'm blurry. Get on blurry. Yeah, spouses can intercede for one another. Isaac, as a concerned husband, he seeks God for his wife because his wife has uh, issue and he seeks out God because Isaac recognizes that his wife was barren. And that's an interesting question to me because my question is, how did he know that he, it was his wife that was barren and not him? How does this man understand or know 
that is his wife. How did Abraham know that it was his wife? And apparently, I don't see what Isaac or Esau or Isaac had any other children, yet he understood that his wife was barren. So in order for the plan of God to work through Isaac, and through Rebecca, Rebecca has to bear children. At this moment, she could not. And the Bible lets us know that the seed, uh, which is Jesus Christ, must come through Isaac. That's Romans, the ninth chapter, verse seven. And Isaac was born a miracle baby also because his mother was barren in Genesis 11 and 30. And I don't know if dad told him about it, but yes, you was the same thing. And he understands that the only one who can help him in this situation is the Lord. My brothers and sisters, I need you to also understand that if you're in a dying, a dead, or a barren situation, you can entreat God. The word entreat means to pray, or uh, it is a cry to the Lord for deliverance. And uh, there are times when we are in situations where only God can answer us. And don't be ashamed to go to God and be specific. The Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, and supplication, with thanksgiving, and all that. In other words, he says, let your request be made known. You've got to be specific to God what it is that you want. Uh, uh, I love the song, anyway, you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. But the Bible told me to be specific. Ask God and tell God what it is exactly that you want. So he entreats the Lord for his wife for the Lord to open up her womb. Isaac prayed the will of God. That's 1 John 5 and 14. Hear me now. If we ask anything according to his will, the Bible says that he hears us. And life for this man was the will of God. Sickness is not God's will. Healing is God's will. And Jesus says, healing brings glory to the Father and the Son. So when you need to be healed, ask God to bring glory or to be glorified in your body through healing. The Bible says, with his stripes, he, we are healed. And I need you to know, lastly, that we, he was not striped when he was on the cross. He got striped and beaten before he got to the cross. So before he got to the cross, we were already healed. So God told Abraham that he would bless Isaac and his seed, Genesis 17 and 19. Now watch this. All three patriarchs married women that were barren. Sarah was barren, Genesis 11 and 30. Rebecca was barren, Genesis 42 and 21. And Rachel was barren, Genesis 29 and 31. Here's my dilemma and my ointment. In my day that I live in, people would say that my family was cursed if I married a barren woman, if my son married a barren woman, and if my father married a barren woman. In my day and time, they would say we were cursed and we could not pick proper women. But for some reason, as it relates to God or as it relates to the Bible, we say that that was part of the plan of God. Well, why can't my situation be part of the plan of God as well? So be very careful. Be very careful who we place a curse on. Yet God opened their wombs and they bore children. Oh my God, today. Let's continue to read. So she conceived. And yes, that word Lord, it means the self-existent one. God exists because he exists. He's the only God that is self-existent. He exists. He says to a, uh, Moses, I am that I am. The word am means to exist. He says, I exist that I exist. I exist because I exist. And he's the greatest God that we can go to. There is nobody else. Come on in here. Let's talk about it. And the children struggle. Here's a key word. And it's interesting that they struggle, my brothers and sisters, and it's also interesting that they were called children in that woman's womb. I'm going to leave that alone. They struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And look at what she did. She also went to the Lord to inquire. Now, her husband entreated God. And she is 
inquiring both of the Lord. So that's beautiful when a husband and a wife can entreat God. Let's see if you want to see that bigger. Let me make it. There it is right there. Yeah, I love that. So Isaac entreated the Lord that he heard and he heard him and God answered his entreatment. <laughs> and Rebecca is now pregnant with the seed of Isaac. Both children while in her womb were fighting or struggling. The Bible said that they struggle. The word struggle is a verb means to break, to crouch or crush, to oppress. Uh, it means a violent jostling. They were bumping against one another in her womb, and there was really nothing she can do. She asks God, what is, <coughs> excuse me, what, what is the reason? What is the purpose? The word inquire means to seek. So she sought the Lord. The word entreat means to pray or even to cry out unto the Lord for deliverance. Yet she, in, she inquired, she sought the Lord. She sought after God for an answer. She, just like, uh, like her husband, understands that in a time like this, the only one who has our answer is not the president, is not the governor, is not the chief of police, it's not the mayor, it's not the ward committee, it's not the alderman, it's not the statesman, it's not the Republicans, it's not those other guys, whatever they call, I forgot their names. It's it's God. The answer, or Democrats, the answer is God. Somebody type in here, seek the Lord, seek the Lord. I must seek the Lord. I need you all to type that. I must seek the Lord. If you want an answer, seek God. If you want a res resolution, seek God. If you want to be upright and come out of the situation, seek God. Because God is the one that has all of the answers. He has the solutions that we need. Verses number 23, beautiful. And the Lord said unto her, now it's interesting. Now, number one, we don't know how God is speaking to her, but God can speak to whoever he chooses to speak. We don't know if he spoke to her in a vision, in a dream, uh, she was daydreaming, if it was a daytime, if it was nighttime, if he wrote it down, if he wrote it in the sand, if he sent the prophet by, if he sent her husband by, we don't know. And really, it's not really important how God speaks. What's important is the fact that God communicates the answer to this woman and deliver me from anybody who says that God does not hear a sinner's prayer. I brought that up simply because when you look at the, the Bible where that is mentioned, the word prayer is not there. <laughs> the man who was healed says, for we know that God heareth not sinners. As point two, the person that he was calling a sinner was Jesus. And the reason he called him a sinner is because the Pharisees called him a sinner. And they was upset and called Jesus the sinner for healing this man. And this man said, well, we know that God don't hear sinners. So he never said the word prayer. Check it out. I don't know how we got that word prayer in there. So the Lord said unto her, two nations, two nations are in your womb and two manner or two types of people shall be separated from your bowels. The one people, people, not person, the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, scripture does not tell us about the communication. Number two, after she inquired or sought the Lord, he gives her an answer. The Lord is the only one who knows everything. Two nations are in your womb. The Israelites, that's Jacob, that's Genesis 32 and 28. And the Edomites, that's Esau, that's Genesis 36 and 9. And it's interesting. When we get to uh, 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 Jesus being born, Pharaoh, uh, Herod, Herod was an Edomite. 
That's why he was so adamant about killing Jesus because Jesus was Jacob and uh, uh, the, the king, whatever his name was, was Esau's boy. No wonder he wanted him dead. So Abraham, the Bible said, that would be the father of many nations. That's Genesis 17 and 5. And this is proof that he would be, a, that, that she would be a grandmother. Watch this. Hear me now. Abraham is going to be the father of many nations. His son, Isaac, is the promised seed. Uh, and then God selects and chooses his wife by the name of Rebecca. God says that he was going to be the father of many nations, which means that Rebecca was going to have a whole lot of children or a whole lot of grandchildren, which means it doesn't stop here because he has to be a father of many, not two, but many nations, Genesis 17 and 5. So her sons would be fathers. Those two nations would break out and go further and further and further. Two manner of people, two different manners of people, two different lifestyles, two different occupations, separated from the womb. During birth, these two nations will be separated. They will also be separated as two different nations at birth. From birth, they will be forever opposing one another, and it has already started in her womb. The children of Israel and the children of Ishmael, uh, Esau, I should say, are fighting in her. So this is an example of the foreknowledge of God. Now, here's my problem. The topic says that God chooses. I don't necessarily, there's a passage of scripture that says Esau have I hated and Jacob have I loved. Now, I don't know if that was the predetermined counsel of God or I don't know if God expressed that because he already knew the two natures of them. I understand the lesson said that he chooses the younger twin. I don't know if he's choosing them because he already knew what's going to happen or did he predestinate him? That's my question on the floor. Why do you think God chose the younger? Why, why, why do you think he chose it? Did he choose him because that's the determinate counsel of God? Or did he choose him because that's the foreknowledge of God? God already knew what those young men were going to do. I welcome your answers below in the comment section. And it's interesting that the, he says, and the elder shall serve the younger because according to custom, I always like to read my books, custom and manners of the Bible, customs and manners of the Jews, customs and manners of Bible times. It, the, the custom is the older one would be served by the younger one. But he says, and the elder shall serve the younger. So we got a cross blessing. We got a mixed up situation in our lesson. We got a custom breaking situation. Come on, let's read. And when our days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins. He kept his word. He said that she was going to have twins. And the Bible lets us know that she had twins. And we see that this is a fulfillment of God. God is keeping his promise. Now watch how these two babies come out. The first came out red. He was a red baby. Yeah, yeah. And that's where we really get that word Edom from. He was red all over like a hairy garment. Yeah. And he was a distinction. Now, it's interesting because of his look, his, that's, the, that's the style. He was wild in character. He was wild in his traits. He was wild even in his body. They call his name Esau, probably because of the redness of, because the word Edom, Esau, and red, and all that kind of mean the same thing. And after, so we do see that he's the first baby. As baby number one. Yeah. And after that came his brother out. And his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. Heel catcher. And Isaac was three score years old when she bore them. Look at what he's doing. He caught his heel. That's interesting 
Y'all fighting in the womb. Now you're fighting out of the womb. He grabs him by the heel and uh, tugs on him. So Esau is the firstborn. Uh huh. Esau was called Esau by his physical feature, red and hairy. His hairy body is how his father would recognize him later when his father was blind, right before he died. He called him to give him some venison, but his mother, his wife, tricked him. But he said, you don't smell like or you don't sound like Esau. You sound like Jacob. Come closer. And his dad was blind. So he 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 uh, grabbed on to him to feel him. But his mother had took an animal, killed it and dressed him up like a hairy individual. So she deceived her own husband. So Esau being the firstborn, Jacob caught his heel. And that's why he's called heel catcher. Isaac was 60 years old. He was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. So Isaac waited 20 years before his son was born. And that's interesting because Abraham waited 25 years before his son was born after God promised it. So don't worry about time when God offers you a prophetic word, a real word and you've got to be patient to wait because God is not moved nor subject to time. Man is. He placed time underneath him. So he's not subject to time. Let's continue. Let's look what these boys was doing. And the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter. Cunning. Cunning is the key word. He was a cunning, 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 which means he was a skillful hunter. He loved the wildlife and the outdoors. He hunted for wild game while his brother Jacob was a, what I called him a homeboy. He's a homeboy. He dwelt in tents. Uh, he was a quiet man, preferred to stay at home, which means he was dwelling in tents. So they lived two different lifestyles at home. Isaac was more outdoors and Jacob was more laid back and quiet, probably like his mother. Uh, yeah, sometimes we take on the traits of the different parents. It's interesting. Now, here's where the problem that were loved right there. Isaac loved Esau because. So his love was based on something. It was based on food. He loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Venison means wild game, wild game. Yeah, that's what that is. That's what venison is. It's wild game. He loved him because of that. That's the food because Esau would bring that food home, prepare for his dad, and his dad would eat it, and his dad loved him for that. But the problem is, here is a separation in the family because Rebecca loved Jacob. She probably saw some of her features. Remember, he was a trickster. It later shows up in this lesson. His mother was a trickster. It later showed up in the scriptures where she tricked and deceived her husband. And then her brother Laban was a deceiver. He was a trickster also. He kept playing games on uh, uh, Jacob. Yeah, family trait. Ah, that's trouble. So both parents love their children, but separately. Esau was loved by his father because of his venison that he made. Esau and Isaac loved the wild game that he would bring home. Jacob, the homeboy, was loved by his mother. Their separate love for their sons would cause a major issue in their life. Here's another question. Question number three. Should parents display their preference of their children in the home. Should parents display their public uh, preferences or affection or whatever I want to call it in the home? In other words, should Esau have displayed that he loved, uh, uh, should his father, Isaac, have displayed that he loved Esau more? Do you think that's proper? Do you think it's an order? If so, why? If not, why not? All right, let's read. We're going to close this out in a minute or two or three. 
And Jacob sawed the pottage. Now, here uh, what they did. He cooked. He sawed the pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. He was about to die. He was tired. He was worn out. He was drained. And Esau said to Jacob, one phrase, feed me, Seymour, or feed me. I pray thee. Now, to pray, it's, it's a term of endearship. He's not praying, but that's, a, that's how they spoke it. He says, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Esau. Okay? So the twins, they have nothing in common other than the fact that they got the same parents. They operate in two separate fields. One is in the field. The other is a stay-home child. One sides spotted and other cooks wild game. Their lifestyle also shows up with their parents' love for them. This pottage was made of what's called lentils or small beans or soup or even called a uh, stew. Esau comes from the field exhausted. He was fainted. He was weary. He was possibly starving and thirsty, and he felt like he was about to die. He asks his brother at his moment of death, his last dying words, was to feed me. Because Esau is a red, or he Esau is probably red because of his situation. Because he's tired, worn out, he's probably turning that red, this color, and that's still his term for Edom. And Jacob, the hill catcher, is seen catching hold on the birthrights. Do you see how their names uh, end up uh, showing up in their character? The hill catcher not only caught hold of his leg, now he's finna catch hold of his birthrights. Sod means to boil or to seed. Pottage is, is something that is boiled, like a stoop or a soup, uh, soup. And the fact that he said he was fainted means that he was weary, he was thirsty, and all of that good stuff. Let's close out. There it is. So, and Jacob said, sell me. Now, that's an interesting word. Sometimes that word means to trade. Trade me this day your birthrights. I want your firstborn rights. The rights of the firstborn. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point of death. And what am I going to profit? What benefit am I going to be getting with this birthright? What benefit is this birthright to me? How am I going to use this at the point of death? How am I going to be pleasing to know that as I'm dying, at least I got the rights of the firstborn son? And the birthright means the firstborn son receives double of his father's inheritance. And then usually after receiving double, he becomes head of household. And not only that, but he takes the balance of it and then he spreads it among the siblings. So the firstborn is called the son of their strength, the son of their joy. That's normally what it means. Uh, so when Jacob said, swear to me this day, I'm not taking your word. We ain't having no conversation, just okay, yes and no. No, swear to me. Now, I don't know if they went through some type of ceremony because usually uh, they, they did what's called cutting of the covenant. That means bloodshed. That means they had to do a ritual. I'm not sure. Scripture doesn't say, but he, the word swear also means to make an oath. Jacob says, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him and he exchanged or he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. My goodness, he despised. He said sell, and a lot of times the word sell means to trade. Remember that birthright is the right of the firstborn. To swear means to take an oath. And the Bible says that he despised, which means to think scorn, to disdain, or to regard with contempt, or to be despicable. He despised his birthright. 
rights. As a matter of fact, I think the Bible says that he sold him his birthrights for a morsel of bread. You'll find that in the New Testament as well. So the firstborn is normally given this double honor. But because of this, he no longer has the rights of. And I don't know what I would do in a circumstance or a situation like that. We don't know where was the next rest area. We don't know where the next uh, oasis was. We don't know where the next McDonald's or nothing was in that area. So he, the, probably the only thing he had was this for him to eat. And he's here probably only had enough strength to even get to where he was. He was famished. He was tired. He was worn out. He was exhausted. He was bamboozled by his brother who told him, swear to me, make an oath with me this day of your birthright. So, and it's interesting, the story doesn't end here, but later on, when the mother helps to deceive the husband, Isaac, then Jacob receives the firstborn blessing. Esau comes and cries out to his dad, but his dad says, I cannot undo what has already been done. And Esau gets angry. Matter of fact, he went and married a Canaanite or somebody, other woman, just to spite his parents. And they were uh, rivaling or rivals, or they were having problems with each other until they died. Until this day, they still have problems. That's it. Lovely lesson. Those of you who want to support and listen, keep in mind, uh, help me, uh, do me a favor, hit that subscribe, hit that subscribe, subscribe to this channel. I will pick up the teachings in the first week, Lord said the same, of October. This is a lesson that I had some of my notes to, and I thought I would go ahead, break into my schedule to do this. But on the norm, I teach the UMI and the Kojic Legacy Edition. I will be teaching this standard um, somebody cooked and, and boy, which is called the international. There's a big confusion. There's a video that I did that explains it all. All right. Remember my motto, teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. And the model of the Sunday school is a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen.